CBS Sports. Got a fantasy question? Email fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. Get ready to win your league. Where fantasy now, here's Frank, Scott, Chris, and Adam. Happy Monday, everybody, and welcome into Fantasy Baseball Today. Frank Sample joined by Scott White and Chris Towers here on June 7th. This is actually the first time we've all been together on the podcast in quite a while. What's up, guys? Uh, there was one last week, I think, right? Wasn't there? We I tried. We tried on Thursday. Well, but your Thursday, gave out. Yeah, yeah, my internet wasn't working, but I thought there was one last week. It wasn't mm. last Sunday, weren't we together? Mm. I don't think so. No. No, I wasn't here. No. I was on vacation. Yep. Tuesday? No, I'm never on Tuesday. Wednesday? Scott's never on Wednesday. Monday? Nope. It was all, solo. Not solo. Duos, basically. Wow. My bad, guys. It's all good. It's not your fault, Chris. Uh, I'm off all next week, too. So, <laughs> really screwing you guys over. We we have that part of the year coming up where, look, people got to take time off. I get it. It's going to be interesting the next couple of weeks or so, next month. But uh, it's bound to happen, man. Baseball season is a long season indeed. Anything interesting happen this weekend, guys? I mean, the good news is there's no news. There, there's no news on in, in Major League Baseball right now. So that's the good thing about all this. Um, yeah, I had the most expensive meal of my entire life last night. We went to the Gramercy Tavern. I've got a friend who's uh, leaving New York, and he's kind of doing a great, like, a bucket list of New York restaurants. And so, um, you know, it was good. Wasn't Was not worth the, like, luxury car payment that we dropped on the on the check but it was pretty good you know please do not yeah. reveal how much money you spent i i deal. don't want to give a specific you've said too much already yeah oh, okay. I, I feel it, i don't usually do that i'm not a fancy food person i was disappointed they didn't have chicken fingers <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you, man. Hey, Does it if take you have to dip game? those chicken fing- uh, chicken fingers <laughs> from a place like that, then it, it was it was a tasting menu, and I was like, "Can I get the kids' tasting menu, please?" <laughs> uh man, let's talk about baseball because I know Scott doesn't want to talk about his weekend. Oh my good, goodness <laughs> gracious! Uh, Scott, where would you like to start? Who is your uh, one of your biggest standouts from this weekend? So there are a few places I could go here. There, there was one player who literally made me have an oh my goodness gracious reaction, but um, we'll save him for a little later, I think. And I, I will talk about Patrick Wisdom of the Chicago Cubs, who just homered twice again on Sunday. That brings him up to seven home runs, even though he has not been playing for very long. It was his 13th game, and he's already up to seven home runs. And, um, you know, I, I thought him being a 29 year old minor league journeyman that he'd be out of the lineup as soon as Anthony Rizzo came back in it, but clearly that hasn't happened. Chris Bryant has moved to the outfield instead to accommodate Patrick wisdom at, uh, at third base and wisdom twice had a 31 homer season in the minors in 2017 and in 2019, it was in what was then known as the PCL. So, you know, hitter friendly environment, but it's hard to hit 30 home runs in the minors. Like you don't see many home 30 homer seasons in the minors, period. Like they're, they're, that's legit power. Um, never hit for much average, pretty one dimensional in that way. So him sticking in the minors for that long, I, I don't know that there's anything here, but in these 15 team leagues where you're I'm struggling to just fill out a healthy lineup. I, I think it's time to pick him up. Now, having said that, I'll say that uh, Jason Hayward just came off the IL. Um, so they managed to, they managed to keep wisdom in the lineup by having Ian Happ sit out Sunday's game. But I, you know, there, there's more competition here. It's going to be harder and harder to get wisdom in the lineup, so he has to keep performing. But I don't see why they're going to take him out fresh off a two-homer game. 
I don't know. It's it's hard to find offense, particularly in those deeper leagues. So I'm just inclined to roll with it till it stops. You know, I was wondering, like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? And I, I was reading a story about how they just plucked him out of the audience and they said it was wisdom of the crowd. So oh, no. I thought there was a joke happening there. That's my uh, that's my contribution. No, I mean, his his batted ball numbers are very impressive. You and his plate discipline, be, his plate numbers. discipline numbers are uh, <laughs> pretty de- de- depressing. But you know so, what? There was a 28 year old who hung around in the minor, actually formerly in the Cardinal system, just like Wisdom. He's 28 instead of 29, and he came up and looked. Look at how awful these plate discipline numbers are. But he just kept homering and homering and homering, and his name is. And that guy is Adelise Garcia, and uh, he's still he's still around, and everybody wants him. I thought you were talking about Randy or Rosarena or Luke Voigt. Or yeah, I thought, were talking, I thought you were talking about Luke Voigt too. I was like, yeah, you know, uh, maybe uh, maybe that's a fair comp. I picked up Patrick Wisdom in Scott White's dynasty league. That's a 24 team head to head points league, so obviously uh, a very deep league there. Scott, you mentioned 15 teamers. You know those roto leagues with corner infield. Um, obviously deeper lineups to, uh, to add him there. Anything shallower, like 12 team Roto, you think if you need a corner infielder, pull it off there or is not yet? Um, uh, I mean, I can't relate in my 12 team leagues. Not that, not that I don't have a 12 team <laughs> league where I'm not. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I, I think it's doable. There, there are more choices obviously. And I don't have a lot of confidence in wisdom. I hope that came across. But, it, it, yeah, I, I just think at this point you kind of have to, if, if you need offense and there aren't obvious players to pick up, I, I really don't think it hurts to pick him up and see what happens. All righty. Patrick Wisdom there of the Chicago Cubs. Chris, your oh my goodness gracious standout from the weekend. Cedric Mullins, who... Um... I think he had a stretch of eight for eight with three home runs between the end of Friday, all of Saturday, and early Sunday. He went three for four on Sunday. Yeah, three for four with a pair of walks, hit a home run, two runs, two RBI. He is on pace for like 25 homers, 25 steals. He's hitting 322. And that comes with a 368 Babbitt, which is high, but it's not that high. You know, it's not so high that you think, like, man, this is a total fraud he's got a a sub 18 percent strikeout rate which is very good in today's environment and i don't know i think he could just be you know a legitimate must start fantasy outfielder moving forward um xba is 272 which would still be actually quite good for this season although not elite like he looks um i think there's really something here and you know we've talked about him a lot over the course of the season And I just, I don't think this is a fluke. He's not the same guy he was before. Another thing we've talked about a lot this season with Cedric Mullins is he did ditch switch hitting and he is only hitting from the left side. Now Um, he was not a good hitter from the right. He had no power. And so I, you know, he's, there's almost no chance he's available in any leagues. I'm sure he's hundred percent rostered right now, but Cedric Mullins is not someone I would necessarily be looking to sell high on. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Cedric Mullins, 93% rostered on CBS, so okay. likely not available anywhere, but he has been amazing. And one of the things that stands out to me in his batted ball data is his pop-up rate, infield fly ball rate, has gone way down, and those are automatic outs. So he's making more solid contact than ever before, 5.9%. Whereas in 2020, that was 21% for him. Back in 2019, that was 25%. So the fact that he's just hitting more uh, line drives, ground balls, even fly balls, like hitting fly balls in Camden Yards is a recipe for success. So I don't think he's going to keep this type of power production up, but someone who's providing both power and speed right now. So, you know, just to, to add some additional context. He had a 796 OPS against right-handed pitchers in, sorry, yeah, in, in 2020. He had a 751 in 20, 2018. Those were the two play, seasons where he had the most plate appearances. So it's not completely out of nowhere that he would be, you know, an above average hitter. Obviously, he's been a lot better than that with a 923 OPS, but 
you know, with the power and speed, I, I think there's a, there's a lot to like about Cedric Mullins right now. Plus, yeah, I wanted it, to get a second, oh my goodness gracious, hitter. Because that might give us like four for the entire season now. <laughs> it's always there, pitchers, you know? There's so many hitter performances from this weekend that we need to yeah. highlight. I'm going to talk about Jesse Winker in just a little bit here as well. But um, you brought up that Mullins has ditched switch hitting, only batting from the left side this year, and still holding his own against lefties. So entering Sunday at 296 with a 796 OPS against left-handed pitching. is Cedric. More more hitters should do that. Yeah, that's what switch hitting is overrated. Really hard. It's, it's too hard to to learn to hit with, you know, from one, mo- it's like different motion, right? You see hitters with completely different stances from both sides of the play because you, it's just not even, it's just like doubling the uh, difficulty for yourself. It's, it's the double the amount of work. I yeah. mean, really, like you have to put in twice the amount of work to develop yourself as a hitter. Yeah, um, I, I, and- I think the, the benefit, I think the the cost far outweighs the benefit. And I in Mullen's case, I wasn't super optimistic. I, look, I thought it would help, but I didn't think it would be mm-hmm. completely transformational because it was already his predominant side. He was already getting plenty yeah. of looks from the left side. And it's not like he was some great hitter from the left side. He just wasn't a total disaster like from the right. But uh, just maybe having so many more reps, you know, even in like even in like batting practice and whatever. Um, I just wonder if it's if it's unlocked something that was being stifled before. And, you know, a third of the way into the season, I mean, we're basically to the point where last season ended. Um I yeah. guess I guess that's beyond a third of the season, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not inclined to question anything that's been going on this whole time at this point. You know, yeah, even Matthew and- Boyd has started to regress. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, you know, I didn't think you didn't think he would be, you know, you think he would be better. Well, it's the kind of thing like with a lot of left handed hitters where you just have to be good enough against lefties. He hasn't been great against lefties, you know, like 296 batting average, but he's not hitting for power. He's got a sub 800 OPS. You know, it, it's Yon Makata's kind of had a similar thing where early in his career, he just could not hit lefties and he didn't ditch switch hitting, but he's reached the point now where he's, good enough against lefties and often if you're a left-handed hitter that's that's enough yep fair enough there with uh cedric mullins jesse winker the man is awesome he hit a triple dong on sunday and now has two three homer games this season he is batting 350 with 17 home runs 37 rbi and a 1077 ops entering sunday's action he was the fourth best outfielder in Roto, 3.9 fantasy points per game. That was tied for third best among outfielders in points leagues. And he is 94th percentile or better in expected batting average, expected slug, and expected WOBA. He's doing this all with a sub 700 OPS against lefties, which is just, he's absolutely destroying right handed pitching this year. I put up a poll on Sunday asking where should Jesse Winker rank among outfielders rest of season, assuming health, of course. And uh, the options were top five, top 10, top 20, and outside the top 20. What do you guys think had the highest percentage in this poll? I would guess top 10, 20. It was top 10, 48 and a half percent for Jesse Winker. And I know before this weekend, I had him inside my top 15. I think, Scott, you had him close inside your top 15 as well. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but what else, well, can, what else can we say I, about Jesse I, Winker? I mean, the guy I is... Men- he's I off. mentioned this was about the point when last season ended. So Jesse Winker's slash line right now is 350, 412, 665. Last year, when the season legitimately ended around this point, Juan Soto's slash line was 351, 490, 695. It was better, but... It was comparable, you know? So I wonder if if Jesse Winker had done this last season, where would we have drafted him this season? Well, I mean, he was going like 200th or something. Yeah. Yeah, he was was not... He he was was late. He was going late. Significantly better than Nick Castellanos last season. And he's been better than Nick Castellanos this season now. After the three homer game, obviously that helps make up some ground. But you know, I mean, 1020 OPS coming into this game. 
They're uh, both really good. It's <laughs> right, 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 right. But like Nick Castellanos was legitimately not that good for fantasy last season. And Nick uh, Jesse Winker had a nine thirty two OPS with twelve homers. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm asking why wouldn't Jesse Winker at the least be ranked as high as Nick Castellanos moving forward? I think that's fair, yeah. and I, I have Castellanos ranked inside my top ten outfielders. I have him at seven. So just behind him, Chris Bryant, Whip Merrifield, Kyle Tucker, Aaron Judge. I mean, it's it's a pretty legitimate group of outfielders. I don't know that I want to move Winker ahead of any of them yet, but yeah, I don't have Cassianos is quite that high. I haven't I had him twelfth. I just moved Winker ahead of him. Because why the heck not? <laughs> <laughs> Man. Castellanos is awesome too. Oh no, it's not an argument against Nick Castellanos. Just it's yeah. just like Jesse Winker over the last 103 games, this is before the three home runs, right. was hitting 304 with a 981 OPS. He's got 29 homers in his last 104 games. He's j- and he was pretty good in 2019 when he was healthy too. Yeah, I, this is a this is a Nick Cast this is a Jesse Winker uh, discussion, not a Nick Castellanos discussion. To be fair, and it should be after this weekend, after what he just did. I do just want to pit some starting pitchers up against each other. You know, we've only gone so long without talking about pitching. Obviously, we've got to talk about some. But I thought, you know, Tarek Skubal, the most added starting pitcher this weekend on CBS leagues, rightfully so, goes out five innings, one run, eleven strikeouts, twenty swinging strikes on one hundred and three pitches. He's been much better over his last five starts. Now that he's gone back to a traditional changeup versus a split change that he was working with earlier in the season. Versus Logan Gilbert. They're both rostered in less than 60% of CBS leagues right now. And I watched this start on Sunday. First inning was rocky. And then he just really settled in. And this was the best that I've seen Logan Gilbert. Uh, Fastball velocity was up. Commanding his breaking pitches. Slider looked great. Seven strikeouts for Logan Gilbert on Sunday. One earned run over five innings pitched against the Angels. 20 swinging strikes as well on 105 pitches. Nine of those on the slider. Eight of those on the four-seam fastball. It's only 52% rostered. Uh, Scooble is at 53%. Chris, if you can only choose one, Scooble or Gilbert, which one would you add? Scooble for me. Um, that's not necessarily a knock against uh, Gilbert, who you know clearly is starting to figure some stuff out and getting more comfortable, but... Uh, scooble has got the deeper repertoire and I, I feel more comfortable betting on him. I mean, you know, Gilbert did have a very good, or I don't know if this counts as a very good start, four walks and in five innings, seven strikeouts. It, it was a good start. Um, he didn't really throw much besides the fastball and slider today. And it still seems like he's, you know, trying to find the feel for the knuckle curve and, and the change up, especially, you know, the change up. I feel like this might've been one of the most, He's thrown the changeup so nine far. times, yeah. nine times, and he got three of the three of the twenty whiffs came yeah. on that changeup. So, yeah, coming in, he had thrown four. Yeah, so this was the most he's used the changeup. He kind of came in as a three pitch guy with the changeup as more of a show me thing. So yeah. that'll be worth watching. It's it's interesting that Scoobal has the deeper repertoire than anybody because the yeah. the knock on him last season was that uh, it's just a great fastball. But yeah, I mean, the, the changeup and slider really come around for Scooble. And to me, it's as simple as, okay, so Gilbert's had one start where he kind of opened our eyes and, and Scooble's had, what'd you say, Frank, five in a row? I know I know the last four for Scooble, 37 strikeouts and 21 innings. A lot of them have been short starts, obviously, but, uh, but short hey, as in five innings, not short as in, you know. Yeah, who's not four. making <laughs> short starts now? Right, right. So which one would would you rather have, Scott? It's well, Scoobal or Scooble. Yeah. I thought I thought that was I thought that was implied, Frank. <laughs> oh, all right. I have to I have to be overt, I guess. But I, I will like I I know Casey Mize has continued to pitch really well. I like Scoo Scoobal quite a bit more than him at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would agree with that. I, like as well as Casey Mize has pitched, he's still not getting a ton of swings and misses. He's not getting like he's getting more strikeouts now than he was earlier in the season. But we also have this loom looming uh innings cap that he's going to be on that they've already come out and said they're going to limit Casey Mize throughout the summer. They might do the same thing with Scoob. Uh, yeah, I don't know why they went with Scoob, but yeah, like they're both young pitchers. So I mean theoretically they could do the same thing, but they haven't said it. So um I will I would take Scoob over Casey Mize as well. Would you guys be okay dropping any of Steven Matz, Frankie Montas, Jamison Tyone for either both one I would be okay dropping any of the three, four 
either Scooble or um, Logan Gilbert at this point. I just, I, w- I think you're chasing upside there. I would, um, I would, I, I don't think I'd drop Mon- Montas for either. I would drop Mats for both. And who was, who was the other name? Jamison Tyone. He's still 75% rostered. Yeah, Tyone, I would drop for Scoople, but not Gilbert. Uh, Frankie Montas on the season has a 4.52 ERA and a 1.41 whip. And what I noticed this weekend, because I was paying very close attention to spin rates, is that he is one of about a handful of starting pitchers. You know, there was, look, there's some noticeable spin rates being down. Frankie Montas was one of them. His slider was down 102 RPM this weekend. His splitter was down almost 300 RPM. And a few others Ooh. that stood out to me, uh, Merrill Kelly had four different pitches lose over 100 RPM. Clayton Kershaw, his fastball was down 71, which I don't even know if that's... That kind of fluctuation happened. Yeah. I, I think... From start to start. I'm, I'm looking at anything over 100 as like being... The, the... We'll just mention the, the elephant in the room, which is Trevor Bowers was down 200 plus in this start. I know it was was early Garrett Cole. Garrett Garrett Cole was also uh, down pretty significantly. Trevor Bauer also notably um, had trouble commanding his curveball in this one. Clearly there was a message sent from major league baseball to teams in some way. I don't know whether it was, uh, Giovanni Gallegos getting uh, called out and having to change his cap in a recent outing. And then Mike Schilt going on that long rant or something. But clearly there was, there has been a message received by major league teams and players uh, that the crackdown on foreign substances and grip enhancers is afoot or about. I mean, Theo Epstein has said as much. There was a, there was a good interview with him by Bob Nightingale that came out early this week that, that pretty much said, okay, this is going to happen now. Yeah. And, and pretty much immediately we've seen spin rates dropping across the league. Garrett Cole was over 100 on his fastball mm-hmm. earlier this week. You mentioned Trevor Bauer, which was over 200 on his fastball. And I wrote about uh, this for Friday's waiver wire with Garrett Cole. If you want to read some thoughts on that, that's still up on the site on cbssports.com. And if it's not clear, Theo Epstein, he's not he's not an executive with the Cubs anymore. He's yeah. he, he works for Major League Baseball. He's like the like joy of the game advisor or something. <laughs> yeah. So so he like has a hand in, in yeah. influencing this happening. Uh another notable one, Corbin Burns today, his cutter, which is kind of his fastball, was down over a hundred. Um, he actually had four different pitches that lost between hundred and two hundred RPM in this start, Scott. Yeah. And yeah. and I'll I'll get to the, I have some things I want to say about that in a second, but just Corbin Burns was way down. Um and, and those three guys, Cole, well definitely Bauer and Burns are like top five in spin rate in all of baseball. Cole, I think, is a little outside of it, but he's top ten. Notably, Dylan Cease, who had maybe his best start of the season, granted it was against the Tigers. Uh, seven shutout innings, 10 strikeouts, one walk. Dylan Cease, his his fastball RPM was only down 16, which is like nothing. His slider was down yeah. 60, but even that's not really something that's going to raise alarm from one start to the next. So Dylan Cease is a top five RPM guy for both the fastball and the slider, and that's something we've been hyping up about him. But there was basically no change there for him in this latest start. Um, so that's an encouraging sign for him. As for the rest of them, I mean, we talked about Garrett Cole after his start, Frank, that his RPM was st- average RPM on the fastball was still way up from his Pirates days. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I'm worried necessarily. Corbin Burns, I brought him up, the big drop in spin rate he saw on everything, Frank, and and he had his best start of the season. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, strikeouts. I, I think you can look at it like the changed ball in 2019 or 2017, I guess first. And then another one in 2019, it affects everyone obviously. And I I think the assumption at this point is that nearly every pitcher is using something to enhance their grip, whether it's rosin and sunscreen, which everybody seems to agree is kind of who cares versus like 
spider grip or whatever they call it, where you could, which allows you to like pick up a cinder block with your palm. <laughs> uh, there's a great athletic piece by, you know, Saris where he uh, did some testing on it. Um, everybody seems to be using something. And so it's going to affect everyone. We don't know how much it's going to affect everyone. It's going to be like an environmental change. I think like the introduction of a new baseball. And what we've seen this year is some of the guys who we thought might be affected by the new baseball really have been. You look at DJ LeMahieu, you look at Kevin Biggio, two guys who we pointed out before the season. If the ball's not traveling as far, they could be really affected. It's a lot harder to say what the impact of that is going to be on pitches because there's so much more that goes into it. This is not just how far the ball travels and we can look DJ LeMahieu hits every single one of his home runs exactly one row deep into the stands. You know, it's, it's not like that. Um, there's, there's a lot that goes into it because some pitches you want less spin. And so if a guy throws a really good, like, uh, who was it? We, we just mentioned someone's splitter was way down. Mont Frankie Montas. Montas. Yeah. yeah. That's actually not necessarily a bad thing. If you lose spin on all of your pitches, but your splitter loses more spin, that's not necessarily a bad thing because there does appear to be evidence that splitters and change-ups are positively affected by low spin rate. So... Yeah. It would, it, you know, would, it would cause it to drop more, right? Yeah, that, that would be the, yeah. the impact. Because the impact of all of this is basically the higher the spin, the more the, the Magnus effect, which is some kind of science term that I don't actually know what it means, but it's how much the ball moves and how much the air flow on the ball impacts. And so with four-seam fastballs, the, the impact on higher, of higher spin is more apparent rise. The ball drops less than it should based on the impact of gravity. There's actually a really, really good sports illustrated piece on this last week where I think Charlie Blackman talks about, he's very blunt about the impact of it and how it's just like you expect the ball to fall more than it does. Cause you've seen a million pitches in your life and most of them move one way. And so when they move differently, all of a sudden it makes it much harder to hit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the biggest takeaway from this, which you guys have hit on is we just don't know. We don't know what the overall effect is going to be by this. Pointed out we don't by, know who's using. Exactly. We have and guesses. Uh, while I mean, Burns' spin rates are down, again, he had the best start of the season for him. Seven shutout with 13 strikeouts to zero walks. So we're going to continue to note these things, obviously. These are factual statements that their spin rates have been down, but it might not be anything. Like Trevor Bauer might still be... Yeah. Really good. Corbin yeah. Brown, perfectly fine. So Yeah, Trevor Bauer is the one I worry about most because we've seen huge fluctuations from him. And, and you know, he was somebody who raised some of the biggest suspicions regarding and this. His, and his control and command got way better. Yeah. Like, yeah. Overnight. And that's the thing. Like, we don't... It's not just spin rate. It's not just spin rate. It's not... Uh, it, it's implemented... You know, they're enforcing it now because they want to see strikeout rate go down, but there are going to be other impacts when pitchers don't grip the ball as well. That it's more going hit by to pitchers. impact pitchers' command. And we yeah. don't that's gonna be the hardest to judge. I mean, we can look at spin rates and say, okay, you know, maybe this guy will be affected in some way, but we don't know the extent he'll be affected. But how are you gonna pick out the pitchers who you know, the ball's just too slippery for them now to throw strikes consistently. Yep. There's there's no way to identify those guys ahead of time. Yep. And even for somebody like Bauer, going back to the point I was bringing up about him, like, it concerns me for him, but like, if strikeouts go down, the way this, today's hitters have been trained to launch the ball, like, what we're going to see is a lot more home runs, right? And if we see yeah. a lot more home runs, suddenly the pitching pool could start to look a lot like it did in 2019, right? Where there's yeah. this huge chasm between good pitchers and bad pitchers. And if that's the case, now is not the time to sell your presumed ace in Trevor yeah. Bauer, even if you are worried about him. You better be getting another presumed ace back in the deal. I think the biggest takeaway from all of this one, if I did have to bet on one impact, I'm very confident. We were already seeing the highest hit by pitch rate in Major League history. I would expect that continues to rise, and we're going to see more injuries as a result of that. And from what I understand, most hitters are generally okay with pitchers using something. You know, like I like I right. mentioned, sunscreen and rosin. That is generally something that you know everybody kind of seems to agree. Like, okay, that's fine. It helps you grip the ball better. We're cool with that. 
it's the other things. Um, but the, the other real takeaway from this is this injects a ton of uncertainty into the league context moving forward. And we're already, I mean, we've already dealt with this season one, a significantly different offensive environment overall, but especially early on in the season than even what we expected. It's leveled out a little bit, but it's still different than it had been the previous years. And then I, I think IL stints, there are, there are currently more players on the IL than at any point last season. I believe there are currently more players on the IL than any point in 2019. And I think over the same time from now until 20, from the same point in 2019 compared to today, there I think is a 57% increase in IL trips right now. So all of this is to say that fantasy baseball has been harder to play in 2021 than I think any other season, uh, including last season. And it's not going to get easier. Yep. It's just, it's the, the introduction of more and more uncertainty is what we're dealing with in yeah. so many different ways. Just for hitters too. Yep. You're making me feel better, Chris, because I'm having, <laughs> I'm having probably the worst season I've ever had. Which and I'm having insane. one of my best. <laughs> so obviously this season doesn't count. <laughs> Which isn't to say all my teams are terrible, but there are three in particular that are just as embarrassing as anything I've ever put out there. Yeah, it's been a very weird season. We're going to continue to monitor the overall offensive environment and uh, looking at June so far, 244 batting average, that technically would be up from the first two months. So we'll we'll monitor these things, but uh, it's it's hard to know when so much continuously is changing here. Before we hit the news and notes, Wanted to let you know what's on CBS Sports HQ this week. As always, CBS Sports HQ is the network to start your sports news day at 8 a.m. Eastern with morning buzz, an hour of highlights, news, and all the days need to know and come back or leave us on all day at 6 p.m. where we break down all the night's action and release dozens of picks from the best analysts and cappers in the sports world. How to watch HQ? It's easy. Go to your Roku, Apple TV, Fire TV, really most connected TVs, and look for the CBS Sports app. Fire it up and check out HQ, the only 24-7 free sports streaming network out there. Some news and notes from the weekend. Royals pitching prospect Jackson Coar will be called up on Monday, which makes him a two-start pitcher. He is 18% rostered. Uh, Coar was the 33rd overall pick back in 2018 and through six starts at triple a this season he had a 0.85 era a 0.88 whip and 41 strikeouts in 31 and two-thirds innings pitch scott is <laughs> or a must-add starting pitcher look i hesitate to call any prospect call up <laughs> a must-add at this point because if jared kelnick is hitting <laughs> under 100 <laughs> i think he is now right after today um i think so it's been like how many how like, many prospect call-ups have been good since the start of last season? I mean, There's been let's, Ian let's Anderson, about... Cabrian Hayes. I guess Sixto Sanchez was good. We got to count him. Yeah. That's I mean, let's it. talk about... <laughs> so, one, rookie hitters have their lowest way to run to create a plus, which is relatively league average since 2001. So, that. Pitchers have the second lowest... Uh, FIP minus, which is just FIP relative to league average since 2000 or since 1992. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and even like, let's, let's think about the last couple of must add quote unquote prospect pitchers, Alec Manoa, who one great start, one pretty bad one. Yeah. yeah Logan Gilbert Jury's still out. Jury's still out. Logan Gilbert definitely hasn't lived up to expectations. Although I think there are promising signs. Um, Daniel Lynch. Yeah. Like I, I, and then we just we haven't seen we've seen Jackson Coar make six starts since yeah. 2019. So, so we have no idea who he is right now. So he has a 0 0.98 ERA at AAA. It could be 890. It could be the reverse of that once he gets called up. But you know, like I I, I don't think he was my highest priority ad in any league I'm in. But I in every league he was available, I put in a bid for Jackson Coar because you just. You you have to take a chance on talent, and if it doesn't work out, you know you move on. But you know, part I, I think one of we did a we did a um, 
a segment last week, Frank, at Lessons Learned this season, and, and one I wish I had brought up then was, I don't know, maybe it's premature to say this, but, you know, for, for the past five plus years, I don't know exactly when it started, but several years now, it felt like if you stashed away the big minor leaguer ahead of time, odds were very good he was going to deliver you a big outcome right away. And and so I, you know, I I started leaning into that more and more over the years. And I I feel like I overinvested in a lot of those guys this year because none of them, none of them have paid off. And so I'm re- I'm reluctant to throw like gobs of fab at, at Jackson Kawar, I guess is what I'm saying, which of course means he's going to be the great one. He's got a great change up. I mean, obviously there's a chance it goes well, but uh, you know. Yeah, I'm I mean, just, look, to, to I'm, talk I'm about him as a I'm reluctant to have the same enthusiasm. As an actual pitcher, there's a lot to like. He's yeah. got a mid to high 90s fastball. Uh, he's a college pitcher, so he's advanced. He was probably major league ready sometime in the middle of last season if they had played a normal season. Probably major league ready sometime at the start of this season. But you know they they wanted to make sure the changeup is exceptional. As Scott mentioned, that is considered his best pitch. Everything else, I, I, from what I understand, is pretty meh. But what we said about Alec Manoa when he got called up, the scouting report was kind of different than what he actually has been through his first two starts because that changeup looks really good. Um, and so that's what I mean about saying we don't know who Jackson Coer is because we've like he hasn't pitched in a lot of competitive games in the last two seasons. So he just he could be completely different than what he was. Yep. And, and we brought this up about prospects previously is the fact that they miss an entire year of development last year, yep. not having the minor league. So I think, you know, definitely a lesson learned. We probably should have factored that into our analysis more, but you know, hindsight being 2020, it's easier to say that now John means was placed on the IL with a left shoulder strain. The MRI did not reveal any structural damage means will be shut down for at least seven to 10 days. Trevor story is on track to return Tuesday. So you can get him in your lineups for this week, though. The Rockies are on the road the entire week. So it's not great, but Trevor Get him in your lineups. Yeah. Adalberto Mondesi went to the IL with that hamstring strain. Josh Stalmont was activated for the Kansas City Royals. Luis Severino made his first start at low A on Sunday. He allowed one run over two and two thirds with three strikeouts. Apparently, he was sitting 96 miles per hour with his fastball, which good to see there from Severino. Just reminder to uh, keep your expectations realistic for Severino and Chris Sale, guys coming right. back to Tommy John because... I don't think they're going to. We know very much. Do we know at this point if there's still a limit on how long a rehab assignment can be? Uh, It used to be thirty days. I I think I I saw that in reference to somebody that. um, Is it was it thirty days or was it? I think it might have been less than that. Well, it might be less for a position player. I think it's thirty for a pitcher. I think Mm -hmm. I saw for uh, as it related to Luis Severino. I can uh, see Severino up by. Late June, maybe he gets one start in July before we hit the All Star break. I think that's probably realistic for him. Uh, the Dodgers are expected to reinstate Tony Gonsolin from the IL to start on Wednesday against the Pirates. Obviously, that is a great matchup, but he will not be a two star pitcher, so keep that in mind. Bryce Harper returned from the IL on Saturday. George Springer is, quote, very close to a rehab assignment. Kevin Biggio began a rehab assignment on Sunday. Evan Longoria is placed on the I.O. with a sprained left shoulder. He's expected to miss four to six weeks. John Gray went to the I.O. with a right flexor strain. Spencer Turnbull to the I.O. with right forearm tightness. Michael Fulmer to the I.O. with a right shoulder sprain. Billy Hamilton, I.L., right oblique strain. G-Man Choi to the I.O. with a left groin strain. Mike Moustakis is about a week away from starting a rehab assignment. Joey Votto could return on Tuesday for the Reds. Tyler Naquin left Sunday's game with a tight left hamstring. Byron Buxton could begin a rehab assignment within the next week or so. There you go, Chris. Yankees manager Aaron Boone mentioned June 15th as a potential date for Luke Voigt to begin a rehab assignment for his oblique injury. Uh, The Mariners want Kendall Graveman to make at least one rehab appearance at AAA, so he likely won't be activated until next weekend. Colin Moran returned from the IL on Sunday. Kyle Gibson uh, will not pitch this week. The Rangers don't want him batting against the Dodgers. He's coming back from a groin injury. So uh, Kyle Gibson, yeah, get him out of your lineups. He's not going to start. Nick Senzel is expected to return from knee surgery in mid-July. Corey Kluber and Eliezer Hernandez were both moved to the 60-day IL for their respective teams. And we started this last week. I'll just quickly bring up a few names that are 
Uh, a little banged up right now. You let me know if you would leave them in your 12-team lineups or deeper. Let's go with that. J.D. Martinez missed Saturday and Sunday with a wrist is issue. Manager Alex Cora said he does not expect an IL stint for J.D. Martinez. Would you guys leave him in the lineup? I don't have enough good players to to sit <laughs> J.D. Martinez unless I think he's going on the IL. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Jock Peterson is feeling much better, apparently, after exiting Saturday's loss um, due to back tightness. Jock Peterson, eh, I mean, he's kind of fringy anyway, but... Hey, there are some leagues where with I would, wisdom now. There are some leagues where I would have to start him. Yeah, I think probably anything deeper than a 12-team Roto League with five outfielders, you probably don't really have a choice with, uh, with Jock Peterson there. Javier Baez exited Sunday's game against the Giants in the seventh inning due to right thumb soreness. Not sure if you guys saw anything there, but starter sit, Javier Baez. One thing to keep in mind with nearly every player we're going to discuss is you may not have to make that decision until Tuesday. Yeah. Um, because right. only the Red Sox, Marlins, Royals, Angels, Cubs, and Padres play tomorrow. So um, if as long as your lineups don't lock once the first game starts, which some leagues do, and I hate them. Um, <laughs> And you'll have to make a decision on bias, but hopefully, you know, by tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern, we should know if he's in the lineup. I'm and planning should, on starting. Yeah. I would I would think he'll start him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you say Kikuchi left his start on Saturday after getting hit by a comebacker on his knee. He's slated to start at Cleveland this week, which is a really good matchup. Yeah. Kikuchi has been awesome. Yeah. I mean, the good thing about starting pitchers, you pretty much always have options at that position. Yeah. So I, I'd probably... I'd, I'd play it safe and set them if, if you know, pre presuming I had options. It's not my internet this time, right? Uh, no, I see Scott <laughs> breaking up a little bit. A little bit of lag there, Scotty boy. Uh, but I did want to bring up a quick prospect update as well. Joe Adele is hot again. He's been very inconsistent this year. Four home runs over his last four games at AAA with only two strikeouts during that time. So he goes through these peaks and valleys this season where he's they really just hot. call him up. Just well, I mean, you know, whenever you can just roll Juan Lagares out there every day, Chris, you just, you got I mean, they're from a like, uh, oh God, what's the term? The some service time. That's the term from a service time perspective. They are highly incentivized to keep him down longer than most top prospects. Cause he did, you know, get 40 days of service or whatever, I guess 153 days of service. So I'm actually not sure there's really. Anyway, that like they would have to keep him down all season to derive any benefit at that point. So actually, they probably should just call him up now. All right, we're going to take a quick break. But when we return, we're going to take a look at the most added hitters and pitchers from the weekend. We'll do that next here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Your number one most added hitter this weekend is Jonathan Scope, who has been uh, very hot recently. How would you guys rank Scope, Jonathan India, and Ty France? All of them are playing well. Uh, specifically, Jonathan India has eight hits over his last five games, including two home runs and a stolen base. He has let off two straight for the Cincinnati Reds. Scope, India, France. Rank him. You know, Scope's been the best recently by a long shot. I mean, he just had this great home run tear over the past week, but he's he's such a limited hitter. I, he's probably my least favorite of the three if we're doing a rest-of-season ranking. Um France, I probably have the most faith in. I, I really trust the the profile as a hitter, and I think his batting average lagged for those that two to three week stretch because he was hurt, and he's looked a lot better since coming off the IL. But India um, quietly has started to started to break out. It looks like uh, this doesn't include his Sunday numbers, but last twenty games. 328 batting average, four home runs, three steals, a 446 on base percentage, uh, you know, 11 walks versus nine strikeouts. I mean, that's that's not a stretch he can probably sustain over a full season, obviously, but it it, it demonstrates his skills in a way we didn't see early on, in a way that got us excited in spring training. So in a in a 12 team roto league, one of those three that I'm doing terrible in, I need a lot of hitting help, and I I picked him back up. I, I will throw out an, an old favorite uh, bit here and just kind of say we're, we're sort of doing the like Jonathan Scope is Jonathan Scope, but Ty France could be anything. It's like 
over the last no. two seasons, going back to the start of last season, Jonathan Scope's on a 26 homer pace with a 266 he, average. He, he hits 20 home runs with consistency, yeah. but yeah. that's about all he does. There's not, he's always fringy. He's a, he's a perma, right. perma fringe status for Jonathan right. Scope. And Ty I think, I think Ty France is a reliable source of batting average who will also hit home runs. I would agree with that. I, I would put France ahead of the three. Uh, scope is fine. I mean, he'll give you a little bit of pop from middle infield if you need that, but he's not going to walk very much. He uh, doesn't have great plate discipline, so he's fine. France, I think you can ride him all. I, I will just say France is it, it's theoretical. Like he's I played mean, 162 games in the majors. He has 14 homers, 63 runs, 60, 68 RBI, and no steals. He's hit 259, and yes. Part of that he hit was over 2019 last year. He yes, he did hit 305. Spring. He hit 399 in his last minor league season. He's hit 300 outside yeah. of that stretch where he was dealing with a wrist injury this season. So, I mean, he just well, has not such a consistent track record of hitting for average. Well, okay. As long as he's been healthy this year, Ty France has been really good. And he looks like he's healthy again. So, uh, I think I'm pretty excited about him. Tyler O'Neill is up to 81% roster. He's the second most added hitter. From the weekend, rightfully so. Going to strike out quite a bit, so obviously uh, temper expectations there in a points league. Paven Smith has been very good for the Arizona Diamondbacks recently. He's got the batting average up over 290 on the season. Patrick Wisdom, we spoke about earlier. Avisael Garcia, 71% rostered. And I think he was one of your sleepers on Friday, right, Scott? Yeah, he was number one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paven Smith was, too, for what it's worth. And I, I actually, particularly like a points league con text I'm, I'm really starting to like Paven Smith he he kind of he kind of reminds me of Eric Hosmer actually he hits a bunch of ground balls too just like Eric Hosmer so right uh, fair comp there uh for Paven Smith Hunter Renfro he's got seven games this week he's 39 percent rostered so if you do need some outfield help he's someone you could look at Andrew Benintendi has been pretty solid all season long he's up to 77 percent rostered. 77 is too low I think for Andrew Benintendi I think that's fair. I mean, I don't know that he has massive upside, but regardless of format, he makes a lot of contact this year, so that's going to help you in points leagues. And then in Roto, he's run a decent amount, and he's on yeah. pace for like 15-plus home runs and steals each yeah. this year. So Also uh, on my sleeper hitters for this week. Yeah. Ben lots Intendi, of ben and, and, I mean, he's 7 for 13 on steals, which is not good, but stolen base percentage is the kind of thing that doesn't really... It's very unstable. And so you can have stretches where you get caught a lot and it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be caught a lot moving forward. So um, I, I think he's probably a 20 steel guy. A few other hitters, a few other hitters that were actually not among the most added right now on CBS that are hot recently. Ryan Mountcastle's last 15 games. He's betting 327 with five home runs and 14 RBI. He's 59% rostered. And Justin Upton has three home runs over his last four games. He's batting 278 with five homers over his last 15 games. He's been leading off consistently for the Angels, too. It seems like that has reinvigorated Justin Upton. Who do you guys like more between Mountcastle and Upton? Upton. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mountcastle's strikeout rate has just been ridiculous this season. Yeah. And um, a few games... That, uh, just like we saw a lot of players turn their season around in May, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw some dude in June because that's normally the biggest jump in league-wide Babbitt from month to month is May to June. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with all this, obviously it's going to benefit offense, all these changes, uh, you know, if, if they are able to in enforce the foreign substances rule with pitchers, that's obviously going to benefit offense. So that's you know, just an extra factor uh, that might help guys like Ryan Mountcastle improve. So I'm I'm open-minded to him turning his season around, obviously off to a very good start in June. But um, yeah, I I think I have more faith in Upton at this point. Chris, which one do you like more? I think probably Upton. Um, the batting average has just been awful the last two seasons, but... You know, it's mostly Babbitt related. I mean, he's striking out a lot, but when has Justin Upton not struck out a lot? And his pace going back to the start of 2019 is 34 homers. So probably Upton. 
Some hitters that may be available in the deepest of leagues. Nick Gordon, a former first-round pick for the Minnesota Twins. He has second base and shortstop eligibility on CBS. He went two for four with his third steal on Sunday, and he has started four of the last five games for the Twins. Luis Arias is coming around. He's playing well for the Milwaukee Brewers. His last 15 games, 273 batting average, three homers, one steal. He has six games this week. Uh, Jonathan Dia uh, Daza has an eight-game hitting streak for the Colorado Rockies. He's batting 331 overall, only 9% rostered. And then Lamont Wade Jr. has three home runs in his last six games for the San Francisco Giants. And he has let off four straight for the team as well. So uh, Nick Gordon, Luis Arias, Daza, and Lamont Wade Jr. Any interest? Arias is batting leadoff right now, right? I mean, it's only been, I think, two games, but he has batted leadoff in two straight games for the Brewers since Colton Wong's injury, which is two more games than I would have expected him to hit leadoff this season. <laughs> it's fair. I've always liked Luis Arias. He he makes a lot of contact. He hit for some power in the minors. Um, so I'm, I'm always going to be interested in him. Yeah. I, I, look, it's a great place to hit in, obviously, in, in Miller Park, so... Uh, you like the venue there. It's not a great lineup, obviously, but as long as he's playing, I think uh, in deeper leagues, I put a few bids in him and in, in, on him in those 15 team roto leagues where do need some help in uh, middle or corner. I believe he has uh, both eligibilities there. Some other hitters that are hot right now. We mentioned Cedric Mullins and Jesse Winker at the top, but Jesus Aguilar is heating back up. He has three homers over his last five games. Cabrian Hayes. We waited. My guy. And he looks awesome right now. He's got, Seven hits, including a home run in four games since returning from the IL. And Glaber Torres, while the power has not returned, his last 30 games, he's batting 318, three homers, three steals, 9% walk rate, 18% strikeout rate. Again, power is down, but I, I, I like the fact that the batting average is, is coming back around here for Glaber Torres. So um, probably not going to get to like the 25, 30 home runs that we were expecting for him, but... Uh, it's a welcome sight there for Glaber Torres. The most added starting pitchers from this weekend over on CBS, Tarek Skubal, 53% roster now, still widely available. So go out there yeah. and get him. Same thing with Logan Gilbert. Uh, Chris Bubich, 41% rostered. Adbert Alzali, finally up over 80. You like to see that. Framber Valdez, 90% rostered. If he is available in your eight, 10 team leagues, make sure you <laughs> add Framber Valdez. Uh, Tony Gonsolin, 75% rostered. Luis Garcia, 86%. He had his third straight quality start over the weekend. Uh, Martin Perez, 38% rostered. Oh, actually, Jackson Kowar is up to uh, 24%. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I said 18% uh, earlier. People people are adding him somewhere. And I want to stress again, if Tony Gonsolin is still available in your league and yes. he's up to 75% now, I think he's going to be must start rest of season. He's got a lot of innings in the tank. The Dodgers need him more than ever. He's been awesome. He's in Every chance was, he's gotten in the majors. I was close to moving him into my top 30 preseason until Rest until the injury. Well, you know, well oh, before the season, until the injury. Yeah. Oh, see, my, one of my contentions about Gonsolin is like, he should be more valuable than ever now because preseason, we didn't really know what, what role he was going to have. Yeah. And like, this is, this is the most defined role he should have to this point. Now, he did lose his two-start status. Remember, we were talking about him on Friday as being a two-star pitcher. It's just one start. It is at Pittsburgh, but I think he only got up to like 60 pitches on his minor league rehab assignment. So I don't know that I'd activate him right away, but you want him on your roster. Mm -hmm. 100%. 100%. Some uh, jinx, you owe me a soda, Chris. Uh, some deeper waivers. Hi, I mean, we buried the lead, man. We're 53 minutes in. The gentleman with the most swinging strikes in a game wow. this season, Patrick Sandoval, yeah. up against the Seattle Mariners on Sunday. Six innings, three runs, 10 strikeouts to one walk he had 32 swinging strikes on 100 Amazing. pitches 17 of those came on the changeup. he is three percent rostered a few other names in deeper leagues keegan aiken ross stripling colby allard and caleb smith who has been starting for the arizona diamondbacks uh do you guys like anyone from this list patrick sandoval i don't <sighs> know if he's gonna start next time through the rotation uh, yeah i, I mean th this was the most swinging strikes in angels history and this team had Nolan Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure they weren't counting swinging strikes. But, but it's still true, Scott. It's still, as far as we know, yes, the most swinging strikes in, in Angels history. Um, yeah, I mean, he's 
he was known to have a good changeup in the minors. San, uh, Patrick Sandoval was. And in 2018, he had a 206 ERA, 0.96 whip, 10.7 K per nine. Was very young when he first got a shot in the majors. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if he's figured something out and is ready to take off. He was facing the Mariners, so you're kind of surprised he didn't throw a no-hitter. But, yeah, I mean, the... The real reason, even though I had, he was the guy I referred to earlier that gave me the, oh my goodness gracious reaction when I saw the swinging strikes. But yeah, I just don't know what his role is for me or forward. So he um, has made one specific change that jumps out, which is he's throwing a sinker now, which he had not done in the past. Sinker, obviously not a great swing and miss pitch, but you know his issue has not just been strikeouts. His issue has been that he gets hit really, really hard. So if a you know, if if he's throwing a sinker instead of a four seamer, or in addition to a four seamer, his four seamer has gotten hit very, very hard in his career. So if that pitch can just be better, you know, maybe there's maybe there's room for Sandoval to be a, a useful option. I did add Caleb Smith in a couple of those fifteen team leagues as well. Um, you know, he's he's been a guy who's excited us in the past with the strikeout potential. Somebody with a high spin fastball and. Um, I think he shows, I can't remember which, what his second best pitch is, but he has a couple of secondaries that have, have a decent whiff rate. Um, and, uh, it looks like, it looks like he's pretty solid in the Diamondbacks rotation now, uh, with some of the issues they've had, uh, his season line, Caleb Smith, 314 ERA, 126 whip, 10.5 K per nine. Now, a lot of that came in the bullpen. Not sure if he's going to be able to sustain that in the rotation, but. In a deep enough league, I think it's worth a look. It is very, very early. He has introduced a curveball over the last couple of seasons. He only threw it 20 times last season. He's only thrown it 62 times this season. So very, very early. Too hard, too easy, to, too early to say, you know, what that pitch might be. And he's only thrown it 10% of the time so far this season. But it's been a good swing and miss pitch for him so far. And he is, he's always going to hit, hit really hard. I think that's just kind of the thing with Caleb Smith. He's got... He's got a little bit of um, Robbie Ray. Robbie, I was going to say like a Marco Estrada, ah. but like Marco Estrada didn't get hit that hard. It was just, <laughs> you know, he's kind of got like, but that kind of like over the top pitching motion that, you know, he'll he'll pitch better than than you would think, given the raw stuff is, is I guess, the way I would put it. Okay. Yeah. And you love I, that Marco Estrada and, comparison. Yeah, like there's no <laughs> podcast that mentions Marco Estrada more than that. Like it's just it's hilarious. That, that was more of an aesthetic comparison than a uh you know. Uh, we right. did have bounce back performances this weekend from Luis Castillo and Blake Snell, which obviously we've been following these two very closely all season long. Castillo at the Cardinals, six innings, one run, five strikeouts, sixteen swinging strikes on ninety-five pitches. It was his first win and his first time going six innings since April 7th, and then Blake Snell up against the Mets. Seven shutout, one hit, one walk, 10 strikeouts with 15 swinging strikes. He did still allow eight hard-hit balls. Uh, it was his only his second start all season with just one walk. So I thought that was key here for Snell. Uh, what would you guys see from these two, Castillo, Snell? Well, um... What did I see from those two? I can't remember so, what I was fighting uh, there was a, a long time ago. <laughs> I'll just point out there was a very good article on pitcherlist.com from Michael Hato uh, about Blake Snell and how he kind of lost his curveball since the start of the twenty nine or the twenty twenty season, and that's been a real issue for him. And and as good as he was in this start, um, you know, the the curveball still wasn't there. Uh, his average velocity, I think Blake Snell's average velocity was way up in this start. Um, that's what I'm trying to look up right now. But Well, um, I, I do think it's worth reminding everyone that before Blake Snell had his worst two starts of the year, which came prior to this seven inning, 10 strikeout performance, uh, he had his best start in like two years, six yeah. innings, 11 strikeouts. So he's had his best start, two best starts since 2019 as the bread of a sandwich of two awful starts. If that yeah, makes so sense in this start. Yeah. His velocity was up. He threw his fastball 60% of the time. Um, the fastball was awesome. 10 whiffs on 31 swings, 38% caught and string swinging strike rate. The rest of the pitches just weren't 
like the curveball and slider were fine. They didn't really get great results. So um, he's changed his arm angle quite a bit over the last uh, couple of seasons. I'm not sure if that's a result of the elbow injury that he was dealing with in 2019, but that, you know, he's, he's throwing much more of a three quarters kind of arm slot. Um, and so, you know, reading that made me a little more pessimistic on Blake Snell moving forward, just because th there do seem to be some real tangible changes in um, his approach. The bread of that sandwich, by the way, was the Rockies in San Diego and the Mets and their awful lineup right now. So, that you know, just, just putting that out there. I, I, I need to see a lot more from Blake. What kind of bread would you say that is? Is that like a, um, that like a pumpernickel? I kind of like pumpernickel bread. I like pumpernickel. Well, no, bread like is the Longhorn good part Steakhouse of this. brings you some like hot pumpernickel bread. I always love that, but can't say I love pumpernickel in all contexts. Well, the bread is the best part of this particular sandwich. Those are the two good starts. So there's you like... Know, I have a friend who believes that the bread is the best part of every sandwich. He is also... He has the worst food takes. Like Adam Azer level bad food takes. So... Oh he also believes the crust is the best part of pizza, which is just nuts. <laughs> There's one part of the pizza that has tomato sauce and melty cheese, and it's not the crust. So that can't be the best part of the... Uh, I can't. Don't get me started on David. Uh, well, we don't have much time left, but I did want to quickly <laughs> run through a few other names here, some pitchers from the weekend. I think now is actually a good time to buy low on Clayton Kershaw. He was at the Braves this weekend. He allowed five runs with nine strikeouts over six innings pitched. And he does have a 3.66 ERA that comes with a 3.07 XFIP and a 3.10 expected ERA. His 15.8% swinging strike rate is his highest since 2015. So he's awesome. I would be sending some offers out for Kershaw if you can. Some studs being studs. Jacob DeGrom, the guy's awesome. And yes, we can move him back up to our SP1 now that he seems to be healthy. He's great. Like There's nothing else you could say about it. Seven shutout with 11 strikeouts to just one walk. He has a 0 0.62 ERA, which is the lowest ERA through nine starts ever in the ever. history of baseball. Jacob ever. Trump is Pretty good. amazing. Freddie Peralta took a no-hitter into the eighth inning against the Diamondbacks, seven and a third, one earned with nine strikeouts. Uh, Shohei Otani was very good this weekend as well. Six innings, two runs, zero walks. Always the key for Otani. The fact that his control looked great in this one, 10 strikeouts with 15 swinging strikes. And Kevin Gossman, man, the guy just continues yeah. to mow people down. Uh, seven innings, two runs, zero earned, 10 strikeouts. He is currently the SP1 in Roto. You heard that right. The wow. SP1 in Roto, the SP2 in fantasy points per game for Kevin Gossman behind only Jacob deGrom. The call to the pen, some bullpen updates from this weekend on Friday. Cole Solcer was used in the seventh inning in a tie game. Paul Fry pitched in the ninth for his second save. So I think we're getting closer to uh, saying Paul Fry is the guy. 9% rostered if you do need some help and saves. For the Tigers this weekend, um, Michael Fulmer went on the IL. Gregory Soto was used in the eighth inning two different times. Jose Cis Cisnero was used in the ninth on Friday. He took the loss and he picked up his first save of the season on, it was either Saturday or Sunday. He is 1% rostered. So in the deepest of leagues, Jose Cisnero is the name there for the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, Lucas Sims, baby. Let's do it. He picked up his fifth and sixth saves of the season on both Saturday and Sunday. Only 27% rostered. So. I think he's got five of the last six saves for the Reds now. Yeah, Michael five of his last six appearances were for a save. Yeah, and in the first of those five saves, he bailed out TJ Antone, I think, in a in a tough spot in the ninth. So I'm yeah. I'm applauding because the Reds finally have settled on a closer. And I couldn't be I couldn't be more thrilled with that. Uh for the Scott, Giants. Go ahead, Scott. I just wanted to mention Gosman being the number one pitcher in Roto Leagues. Like <laughs> he was waived by the Braves on August 5th, 2019. And now he's the number one pitcher in Roto. That that is that is an amazing turnaround to a career right there. Yeah, kudos to him. Obviously, you know, his velocity is up. And the Giants, man, the Giants have done great work with these starting yeah. pitchers the past couple of years. They, they've, they're they getting a lot out of Ant Anthony Desclafani right now. As long as Alex Wood remains healthy, he's been great. So shout out to the Giants and Kevin Gosman. And speaking of those Giants, Jake McGee was used in the eighth inning 
on both Friday and Saturday with Tyler Rogers being used in the ninth. Rogers picked up his seventh and eighth saves of the season. He is still 50% rostered on CBS. Um, Diego Castillo got his ninth save on Saturday. JP Fireisen was not used from uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Fireisen then pitched on Sunday. For the Twins, they basically flip flopped. It was on Saturday, Taylor Rogers in the eighth. Hansel Robles got his fifth save. Uh, and then they did the opposite on Sunday. Uh, Taylor Rogers came in in the ninth inning and he got his fifth save of the season. There was a bunch of other stuff. Uh, what is the most notable here? Daniel Bard. He um, had a two inning save on Sunday. He's actually been very good recently. So, yeah, he already is down to 375. How did that happen? Yeah, <laughs> credit where it's due for uh, Daniel Bard. There's not many streamers on Monday, but I'll just ask you guys uh, would you be willing to stream Jackson Coar in his debut at the Angels, Dylan Bundy versus the Royals? or Ryan Weathers versus the Cubs? Any of those? Not me, uh, guy. I'd rank them Bundy, Coer, Weathers. Coar? Coar. Coar. Okay. That's, I'll mispronounce it the next time. <laughs> Y'all will. And then on Tuesday, Andrew Heaney versus the Royals, Chris Bubich at the Angels, Carlos Martinez versus Cleveland, Adrian Hauser at the Reds, Antonio Sensatella at the Marlins, and Marco Gonzalez at the Tigers. Marco. Uh, yeah, I like Gonzalez. I like Keeney versus KC. And uh, I think Hauser at Cincinnati could be fine. Could go okay. All right. We're going to wrap there. It was a very busy weekend of action for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. When we are back tomorrow, the, the we might actually only be Chris and a bunch of fun guests. So just giving you guys a heads up. Uh, Scott will definitely not be here, and there's a chance that I might not either. But just wanted to give you all a heads up. Uh, we're going to wrap there, and we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye!